Okay, hi everyone. So what I've prepared to talk about today is, is um, a lot more, a lot uh, less explicit about language teacher education um, and language teachers even. It's very, they're, they're kind of implicitly agents kind of operating in the background of the kind of larger narrative that I'm spinning here. So I'm talking about uh, English language learning, internationalization, and neoliberalism um, in the higher education context of Canada and how that affects international students and their English language learning. So, I've been teaching English for academic purposes and working with international students at Canadian colleges and universities for a number of years now. And I'm really curious as to how internationalization and neoliberalism are informing language policies and language ideologies about English that are circulating at the uh, institutional, national, and global scale levels, which in turn create discursive spaces in which these international students negotiate identity and their relationships with English uh, instrumentally and symbolically. So I'll begin by just providing a brief overview of my talk. I start by describing some of the conceptual particulars of my research in terms of the emerging field of uh, ethnography of language policy and the notion of English as an international language. I then look at several examples of internationalization and neoliberalism in institutional and federal policy literature in Canada and suggest ways in which they constrain and construct subjectivities of uh, international students. And I conclude with a brief look at where the national policy stance of Canada towards international students intersects with that of Brazil and make a few comments about the next phase of my research project. So in terms of the conceptual background, over the last decade or so, there's been a turn towards ethnography in language policy research, uh, focusing on how local agents engage with top-down and more traditionally analyzed text-based policy. Uh, several researchers in the field have also proposed a broader conception of language policy as both explicit and implicit, top-down and bottom-up, uh, de jure and de facto. This is primarily coming from uh, Teresa McCarty. Um, so the de facto language policies and responses to policy by local agents, which typically constitute the empirical findings of ethnographic language policy research, have proved indispensable for understanding how the policy process works in its entirety, providing, in Johnson and Recento's words, a theoretical and conceptual orientation that combines the macro and the micro, offers a balance between policy power and interpretive agency, and is committed to issues of social justice. Um, so within this broader conception of language policy that includes the perspectives, beliefs, language ideologies, and practices of uh, kind of local agents, I think it's also important to note that these types of perspectives and ideologies are also expressed at the macro level in much less direct or implicit ways, and this is also not to mention the unintended effects of these macro level policies. So in this paper, I'm going to look at several examples of this indirect top-down policy. So in a sense, kind of presenting a discourse analysis of several national or institutional policy positions as part of the, the top half of the first kind of steps, uh, the macro component of, of an ongoing critical ethnographic language policy research project. So to talk a little bit about English in international education, uh, one of the current trends in the popular or lay conception of English as an international language or global lingua franca is to view the, the language as a skill or a commodity with uh, emancipatory and liberatory qualities that's detached from any of its historical, political, social roles, and symbolic indexicalities. Um, as such, the acquisition of this skill, this skill is typically expressed in simplistic terms as a form of capital providing material and employment success for individuals in the new global marketplace. But at the same time, at the same time many nations are also developing explicit and implicit policies which reflect a view that these individual citizens learning English contribute to the material or economic benefit of the nation. So in the case of non-English speaking countries such as Brazil or China, an increase in the number of students studying STEM subjects abroad and learning English is typically expressed in terms of competitiveness and entrepreneurship of the nation as well. Um, so in the case of countries such as Canada, high numbers of international students and intensive EA pro EAP program language learners in higher education serve as a valuable source of revenue and also produce a potential generation of new Canadians who've already supposedly assimilated and acquired the necessary language skills and domestic credentials. Um, so now I'm not saying that these desired outcomes don't, don't ever happen, but just that I think this is a rather narrow view of how the English language is spreading and the advantages that it brings and it also allies many of the concomitant disadvantages. So to look at this kind of lengthy quote from Pennycook, I think this argues this pretty well. 
that particularly salient today are claims that English is merely a language of intercultural communication rather than a language embedded in processes of globalization. English holds their promise of social and economic development to all those who learn it rather than a language tied to very particular class conditions and possibilities of development. The thing called English colludes with many of the pernicious processes of globalization, deludes many learners through the false promises it holds for social and material gain, and excludes many people by operating as an exclusionary class dialect, favoring particular people, countries, cultures, and forms of knowledge. So in the case of international higher education, it should be noted that beyond these exclusionary qualities of English, there's also financial and other barriers that preclude a considerable portion of the population of sending nations from studying abroad. So what I want to highlight here is that despite the fact that these discourses circulate globally and the buzzwords today are these terms like internationalization and globalization, unsurprisingly many of these practices surrounding English remain devoted to maintaining the hegemony and the advantage of the nation state. So in terms of the processes of globalization that I just mentioned in, in the quote from Alistair Pennycook, internationalization is touted as the central strategic reaction for Canada's universities. Uh, a recent report commissioned by the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development positions internationalization as a key driver of Canada's future prosperity, particularly in the areas of innovation, trade, human capital development, and the labor market. And the website of the International Office of my university uh, describes internationalization um, as, as being widely understood as a university's response to the big forces of economic, social, uh, and cultural change known as globalization. Sorry. Uh, this setting up of globalization is an unstoppable force to which internationalization is simply a response uh, or attempt to harness some of the power of seems to me to be quite predominant in the, uh, in the structuralist literature on international higher education. Um, Altbach refers to globalization as the broad economic, technological, and scientific trends that directly address higher education and are largely inevitable, as opposed to internationalization, which is specific policies and programs undertaken by governments, academic systems, and institutions, and even individual departments to cope with or exploit globalization. Uh, this bifurcation of globalization into big and broad inevitable processes on the one hand and specific policies at the institutional level or even the national level on the other hand, I think has a localizing and limiting effect on engagement with it and the discourses surrounding it and essentially creates a border that artificially limits the agency, responsibility and purview of particular institutions and nation states. Um, so this now focus and consideration of national concern affects how these internationalization practices are conceived and in turn I think it has incredible effects on how languages and language teaching at, in higher education are, are set up. So the website for the international office at York University has a number of bullet points in their kind of shout out to internationalization. Um, so these are two of them here. Languages are central. Internationalization means overcoming monolingualism. We'll offer more languages, especially non-European ones, and we'll find ways to integrate language study into the rest of the curriculum. Uh, the second one here, international experience is central. We'll provide a wide variety of opportunities for our students, including exchange programs, shorter term study abroad courses, and international internships. Uh, for those students who cannot spend time outside of Canada, we'll find meaningful international experiences at York. So there's several things I want to draw your attention to here. So in the first bullet, while this claim of internationalization is overcoming monolingualism sounds great to me on the surface, the fact that it primarily means, uh, the primary means for this which it happens is the increased study of non-European languages, I think fails to capitalize on the already multilingual character of the campus. And no mention is really made in the strategies to uh, integrate and exploit the already existing linguistic assets or resources of international and domestic student speakers of other languages into the curriculum or campus life more generally. The second bullet point clarifies the fact that the primary beneficiaries of these internationalization initiatives are domestic students. So in short, internationalization narrowly conceived like this, primarily as Canadians spending out time outside of Canada, I think is a largely unidirectionally uni uh, designed local endeavor that seeks to create domestic or national advantage. Um, the point about integrating language study into the curriculum is something that, that might apply to international student learners of English, but I, I can talk a little bit more about this policy in a moment. Or about this possibility in a moment. 
So there's a considerable amount of literature devoted to the rise of neoliberalism in higher education with the emergence of new modes of management and operations and changing goals towards financial profit, efficiency, entrepreneurship, etc. Um, specifically working on the field of language, researchers such as Marnie Halgro and Norman Faircloth have tracked the increasing neoliberal marketization of higher education, for example, as encoded in the rise in usage of overdetermined keywords like customer. Um, other researchers such as uh, Kubota and Park have noted how neoliberal rationalities assign the responsibilities of English language learning uh, onto individual entrepreneurs of the self as a sort of technology of the self or form of governmentality. Um, Looking at language and neoliberalism in the broader context of Canadian immigration, uh, Miller maps gene a genealogy of discourses of language that moves towards those grounded in notions of human capital with a focus on what's now pretty much exclusively being referred to as language skills. Um, so the example I provide here demonstrates a convergence between the discourses of language in immigration and in higher education in Canada. So, according to a recent statement from Citizenship and Immigration Canada, international students are a future source of skilled labor, and they may be eligible upon graduation for permanent residency through immigration programs, such as the Canadian Experience class. Uh, international students are well prepared to immigrate to Canada, as they've obtained Canadian credentials, are proficient in at least one of our official languages, and have relevant Canadian work experience. Uh, this perspective on international education also constitutes a central argument of a recent report commissioned by DFAID, the Department of Foreign Affairs I quoted from earlier, and is repeatedly, uh, repeated frequently in popular media calls for increasing numbers of international students. Uh, in this case, the model that's most often referred to is Australia, which has pursued an aggressive uh, internationalization uh, strategy over the last decade that has recently backfired in terms of tension between local populations uh, and the students, uh, the increase in lower quality uh, private institutions popping up, and that's resulted in failing numbers over the last several years. Um, just to say a little bit more about the Canadian Experience class, it's a new immigration class that was introduced in 2008 that expedites the citizenship applications of students without their having to leave Canada after they've graduated. Um, now, many of the university and college students I work with express an interest in this program, and numbers are going up quite aggressively. But I think, based on these students that I speak to, who are often low-level undergraduates, um, I have to take their kind of desire to stay in Canada with a bit of a grain of salt, because I remember the first time I left Canada, I, I was never coming back. I was going to stay where I was. So these things sort of change. Um, it's also important to note that even though official languages in the plural are mentioned here, the de facto language is English. And the Canadian Experience class only applies to prospective re residents outside of Quebec, as Quebec has its own uh, immigration programs and quotas. Um, so although the CEC does require language testing with a minimal range of scores based on the Canadian language benchmarks, with, which Brian mentioned earlier, uh, less attention is given to exactly how this language learning happens within the colleges and universities themselves. So in practice, many international students must enroll in intensive EAP programs, which a number of researchers such as Christian Chun um, have identified as discursive spaces of neoliberalism, which promote subjectivities as the accumulation of skills and encourage students to become entrepreneurial selves. The skilling of English and focus on economic and instrumental ends obscures the educational value and social cultural meaning of language learning. Uh, Related to the internationalization initiative noted above, in the case of York University, conditionally accepted students are required to take ESL, EAP courses that are based exclusively around sustained content on Canadian topics. Now, I was going to say a few words here about um, Brazil's Ciencias Sem Fronteras program and how kind of English language is integrated in that, but I think there's many of you here who know a lot more about that program than I do, so I'll maybe let you speak to that later. But, uh, so I'll just jump to my final points here. Uh, so what I've described here I think is a rather schematic and superficial overview of some of the language policy conditions that are currently affecting international students in Canada. Uh, at least in my student, in my university, uh, there's little evidence of integrating language study into the curriculum for most international students, particularly the undergraduates at the Keele campus, um, in the form of providing more extensive English language study or support or promoting multilingualism. 
Uh, in addition, students from a wide range of backgrounds and preparing for a study at a, for study at a range of levels um, are being funneled into the same uh, intensive English and EAP programs, which can hardly address all of their needs uh, at the same time. Uh, related concerns can be found in the conditions and training uh, of the teachers who work in these programs, who typically work part-time for low wages with no job security, and the also recent outsourcing of English language teaching to for-profit education pathways programs, which are being given uh, access to the university infrastructure of some of our universities. Uh, there's also the offloading responsibility for teachers and institutions onto the students in the form of increased use of standardized testing. So, to return to my discussion of ethnography of language policy above, um, I think there's a really great need for research on how these top-down conceptualizations of internationalization and the neoliberal rationalities that come with them are affecting international students as they grapple with learning and studying English as a second language, as well as uh, in their content courses. So what I'm hoping to do in the recent year is some extensive ethnographic fieldwork among these students, uh, both in and out of the classroom, to learn of their perspectives and of their teachers on these language policies and the language ideologies that inform them. Um, so specifically, in the case of students who are studying on Ciencias Sem Fronteras scholarships, I think it would be re really valuable for this research if it was possible to cross national borders and consider these student perspectives along their trajectories from, from their training here in Brazil through their sojourns in Canada and then back home in Canada. So thank you very much.